So I am Zoe and this is Emily here. We also have Emma somewhere behind me um, and we make up the student staff partnership with Rebecca Olson this semester, which a big part of it was planning this event. So thank you all for making this possible. Um, we've got some amazing speakers tonight. We've got Tim, Chichilia, Ella and Nathan. No, Nathan. Tim, Nathan. Nathan. <laughs> there we go, almost. I think that's um, me anyway. <laughs> thank you. Um, and also just like to acknowledge um, that we're on the sacred lands of the Yoruba and Jagara, sorry, the Yagara and Turubu, um people. Um, we'd like to acknowledge that but this sovereignty was never ceded as well. Thank you. And so we're starting off with Nathan, is that yeah, right? So. Would you like to do this one? Or? Um, oh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. All good? And cool. Okay, so um, thank you, Emma, for the invitation. Um, so my name's Nathan St. John. Uh, fun fact, I used to work at the Pizza Cafe uh, when I was an undergraduate here, um, but I'm not here to talk about careers at the Pizza Cafe. Um, so I graduated six years ago uh, from a social science uh, degree here at, at UQ. I did public policy. Um, so since that time, I've worked at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So I went in there as a grad program. And I've recently moved to a new organisation called Construction Skills Queensland, um, which, which many of you probably haven't heard of. Um, so I'm definitely one of these crazy people who loves their job and loves the field that they're in. Um, and the field that I'm in is, is data analytics um, and applied research. Um, so my job tonight is just to describe in detail what my journey has been like post-graduation. Um, and I'd like to focus on, you know, the specific social science skills that have helped, have, that have enabled my career um, and that I still use on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll start with the ABS. So um, once, I, once I graduated, I went into the ABS graduate program. So they have what's called a general stream, which is open to any, any graduate um, from any discipline that many of you may, may know about. Um, so you've probably all heard of the ABS. So there's a number of domains or statistical collections that a person could work in, economics, crime, education. This is where people's jaws usually drop. The area that I worked in was causes of death. So essentially it was literally the goal of the team is to produce Australia's mortality data set. So every single person that dies in a calendar year goes through our system. We classify those causes of death. We compile that into a number of data cubes and we send that out into the public. So of course, there's a lot of confidentiality. Um, there's a lot of de-identification and confidentiality that comes along with that. Just wanted to say that up front. Um, it is one of the most essential data sets, uh, health data sets for the country. Um, it feeds into a lot of health initiatives. One of the key ones um, is, is closing the gap in Indigenous disadvantage, particularly Indigenous deaths. Um, it's also used in a number of other health prevention measures, so suicide prevention. Um, you know, car accidents, all that kind of stuff comes out of that team. Um, so my role in the team was pretty diverse. Um, everything, everything from learning how to classify different causes of death on a death certificate um, to compiling written analytical articles that go along with the publication. Um, you know, manage, managing teams, managing workflow, that kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, I was lucky enough to join the ABS at a time when it was going through and it continues to go through a period of change where they're trying to look outside of their routine stats to provide more insight into the data that they collect. Um, and that's linked to my first major highlight uh, as part of the organization. So pretty early on, I was asked to do my own, lead my own research project. Um, and again, this is a pretty morbid area, but it's very, very important. So my role was to determine um, how frequently the loss of a spouse preceded the suicide of an elderly male or female. So really, really um, critical um, kind of project as it can be linked to suicide initiatives, um, suicide prevention initiatives and so forth. So this was where I could first leverage some of the skills I learned here at, at, in the social science degree and that is the qualitative data analysis. So literally that project was using, you know, the stuff you learn in first year qualitative research methods, um, you know, content, anal content analysis, thematic analysis, discourse analysis, because essentially what I had to do was read through these cases, develop a number of themes, and then be able to analyze that, um, you know, in a relatively sophisticated way and, and communicate that back to the audience. Um, so 
you know, that's, yeah, that's, that's using the skills that I learned here. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm glad to say that, that, that the degree did set me up for success and it, that project ended up better than I thought it was. So um, I ended up presenting that um, at a national suicide prevention conference, um, you know, and was presenting to a room of suicide experts. Um, and here's me, you know, one, two years out of university. Um, so that was really good because that was catalytic and a lot of other um, roles and, and opportunities that I got. Um, so the next one was similar how the ABS was moving from, you know, routine stats to kind of this insights and analysis. Um, I was fortunate enough to then be asked to work um, in a quantitative project that looked at 50 years um, of mortality data in Australia. And we're trying to look at trends in, in things like heart disease and that over time. That was, was really lucky to, you know, the other thing the ABS was doing was working more with external consultants. Um, and I got to work with, you know, one of Australia's leading palliative care specialists. He was the medical consultant on that project. Um, so it just enabled me, you know, the social science component of that was the, you know, intro to quantitative methods this time is the kind of stuff that gives you the fundamentals. So when you're asked to do that project, you can, you know, you don't know everything, but you know enough that you can be confident that you can play a role. Um, so, you know, that was a really well received project. Um, it got picked up by, you know, like the Australian ABC News, that kind of stuff. So that was really gratifying, I guess you could say, uh, for me. Um, so by now I was really enjoying my time at the ABS um, and that, that led me to, you know, what was probably my career highlight um, to date. And that was, I was asked then by my assistant director to join her um, on, a on a mission to Fiji, where we were um, facilitated a workshop with, you know, senior government officials and mortality st statisticians, specifically to help them to do what we do in their, in their countries. Um, and so, yeah, and, and that was funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs. So it's part of the long-term um, statistical capability relationship that the ABS runs in the Pacific region. Um, but that was fantastic. So the World Health Organization, UNICEF, um, the UN stats, so like stats group were there. So it was very, very, um, just a very, very re rewarding kind of project. Um, so my role in that was to run a series of workshops in how to kind of classify causes of death, how to do the, run the analytics, um, and how to communicate those results. So again, you know, really just leveraging the skills that I learned here and was learning along the way to be able to, to do that. Um, so, you know, that was, yeah, as I said, that's definitely a career highlight to be able to help, you know, five, uh, sorry, not sure I mentioned, but the goal was in Fiji. So five Pacific nations came to that workshop. So then they go back to their, their countries and they run their own reports and analysis and so forth. So really, really great uh, opportunity. Um, and, you know, I must say that the ABS is a, is a great organization for those kinds of, um, you know, in-country missions and so forth. And they really, I'm sure that, you know, I know that that works continuing since, since I've left. Um, so on that note, so at the beginning of 2020, you know, I, I, I started to explore where I could, you know, further develop and challenge myself, um, as a data analyst. And I really wanted to kind of get into more of the applied research type stuff because um, I really enjoyed that at uni as well. So um, I, well, I know what I did then, but I better read my notes. Um, so I was at this time that I saw a senior analyst position um, with, with CSQ, Construction Skills Queensland. Um, so, and that, that position really combined both of those areas. So they wanted an analyst and they wanted someone who could, you know, run applied research projects. So I was like, cool, haven't really heard of those people, but I'll dive in. Um, so just to give a bit of background on what CSQ is, has anybody heard of that by any random chance you have? Wonderful. Um, that's more than sometimes we get. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, um, CSQ is an industry training fund, so it's a not-for-profit. Um, and the way we work is we take a, take a small levy of every construction project in Queensland, and then we invest that money back into the workforce, you know, in, in capability and workforce development type stuff. Um, so we don't deliver the training ourselves, but we, we wholesale pay training organisations and small businesses to run that training for, for a subsidise, and we subsidise the, the fee. Um, and it's a sizable investment. So this year we're, we're pumping almost $50 million into the Queensland construction industry from a training point of view. Um, and 
This investment includes a range of things. So, you know, classic working at heights, confined space, that kind of stuff, all the way through to suicide prevention and mental health awareness, which is really, really important in, in a male dominated, in male dominated industry like construction. Um, but the important part for this conversation is that some of that money is allocated into like a research and analytics unit within CSQ. And so that was the, um, that was the unit that I joined in 2020 um, and, you know, have since been promoted to the manager of data insights. Um, so the mission of that unit is pretty broad, but essentially it's all about providing those insights and research on behalf of the industry. Um, so, um, and the reason I was brought on was to help drive that research mission. Um, and so, so when I got there, that already conducted really robust research with the CSIRO to figure out what are the new technologies that are coming into the industry and new industries that are emerging in Queensland. So things like, you know, automation, all the stuff you guys have heard about, VR, you know, renewable hydrogen, um, internet of things, all that kind of stuff. So they essentially mapped out what could happen and they needed someone who could then translate some of those key parts into more detailed experiments to see, you know, what is the actual um, status of these technologies in terms of training. Um, so, um, so that's kind of been my, the major part of my role at CSQ and um, definitely the, the two highlights of the, of, the, of the projects that I've been able to manage um, and, and fund. So the first one is uh, VR, a virtual reality project. Um, and what we're doing is there's a lot of hype around virtual reality. Um, so what we're trying to do is test its effectiveness um, compared to normal face-to-face -face training in the construction industry. Um, and this, um, this is a really important, important work, like none of this type of stuff has been done in the construction industry specifically. Um, and now that we're moving, you know, in this, the COVID kind of environment, like contactless remote training is, there's a bit of an imperative there, so it's come at a good time. Um, so in order to do this, we kind of use a collaboration model. So we've partnered with um, VR experts from QUT, We've partnered with a startup, uh, startup VR company that's Brisbane based, um, and we're working with training organizations as well. Um, the cool part is, you know, this is really high quality science that we're trying to do. Um, so what we're trying to do is bring in more than hundred construction workers, randomize them to different conditions, and then test the VR versus normal face-to-face -face stuff. So we're really trying to get the science behind this rather than just, you know, join the hype cycle or whatever. Um, so my role in that, uh, essentially I'm the a project manager. So, you know, conducting things like literature reviews to identify what is the pinch point at the moment for this technology and how can we test it? And then engaging those partners, bringing them on board. Um, we do fund the research by the way. Um, so it's not that difficult to get partners. Um, and, you know, going back to the social science stuff, it's, it's, it's all about those research methods and being able to tweak the projects as they progress to keep them on in scope for what CSQ wants rather than what you know QUT or a partner might want. Um, so that's a really useful kind of skill set to have to be able to engage with semi-complicated stuff and say, you know, I don't think that's going to work or that's a great idea. Um, so the one I want to close on is is another really really cool one that we've got going, and that's um, that's looking at renewable hydrogen. So not sure if many of you have heard of this kind of nascent, potentially large renewable hydrogen industry that's emerging in Queensland. Um, we have the world's first minister for hydrogen. You probably know that. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion at the moment about how big this industry could be, where it's gonna be. So CSQ's interest is, well, what is the impact on construction workers? Do we have enough? How much is it gonna cost? Where are they gonna come from? Um, because if we can get those costs right, Will be more competitive internationally with our trade partners and so forth. So on that front, we've we've got a collaboration with uh, research scientists and economists from the CSIRO um, to explore, get to explore that whole domain. Um, and the way we're doing that is through what's called scenario analysis. So we're developing a number of different possible futures for the renewable hydrogen sector, and then modelling the size of the workforces that would be required across those domains. Um, that's a pretty basic way to, to explain it, and that goes all the way out to 2050. So hopefully by the end of that, we've got something nice for the minister to have on his desk um, so we can start that conversation. 
because um, as I said, it's not just about jobs and labour, it's also about our role in decarbonisation. Um, so it's got a you know, clear link to the state's renewable energy target, that kind of stuff. So that's the broad context. Um, so again, doing the, uh, being the project manager of that research um, and, and basically, again, instead of the applied research stuff, this is more about conducting really rapid literature reviews to try to figure out what's going on from, from the organization's perspective, like what's our role, what's our perspective, um, and then communicating them back to the CSIRO, all in the spirit of having a nice clear scope for this work to kind of to happen through. Um, so that's about it. Um, in closing, yeah, I wish all undergrads, you know, I wish you guys the best. Um, I know that I've had a great time at uni and having a real ball out there um, in the data analysis and research space. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, so if we have any questions, we have a mic to pass around. Um, Yeah, I know that was a lot, so. <laughs> um, was there anything in particular in your undergrad? Did you do anything extra that you think? Oh uh, yeah, I did, I did tons, yeah. yeah. So one of the things, yeah, I was very obsessed about getting something like lots and lots of stuff on my CV. Mm. Um, one of the things that I did in particular, I realized pretty early that there was a big future in the kind of quantitative disciplines. Um, so, you know, I went as hard as I could on those courses and I know stats isn't everybody's favorite course, um, but it wasn't my favorite, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's such a useful thing that, yeah, don't be scared of it. It's a great asset to have. Um, but then I'm not sure if there's still like a capstone kind of project in, in the social science world. Um, but what I did was just made sure that I was on a big quantitative project for that, um, so that I could, you know, a learn stuff but B, be able to go to an employer and say, you know, I've done this. Um, and so, you know, I didn't know at the time, but that was really useful because that research ended up in a publication. So then I could go and say, wow, look at me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Even though it was, you know, it wasn't driven by me as such, but it's just the more you can, the more you can offer in terms of this discrete thing that you've done and there's an impact and outcome, the better. So I would say that that's, that's a huge thing. So, you know, focus on the stats, research methods, all that stuff, literature reviews, writing, that stuff will help you in any, any discipline, I would argue. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? All right. Um, would you say there's still like a really big quantitative like gap to be filled in the current marketplace? Huge. Yep. Yeah. Huge. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's gotten bigger. Okay. Yeah, and so it doesn't mean that anybody can just walk in and you know do it, but it means that if you're committed um, and you you know you kind of yeah if you commit to that discipline, I think that there is as vast opportunity because mm. um, there's obviously the data analysis and then there's this whole new data science thing. Mm. So they're separate disciplines, but they're, they're intimately intimately related. Um, so yeah, it's just been identified as like a core skill shortage for the country. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So stats courses. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the thing is that, you know, data and analytics and data analysis isn't really sophisticated statistical modeling. Like that's a component, but a lot of it is knowing how to use Excel, not being scared of data sets and just having that will to kind of help out in any way that you can. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like, I don't, I'm not saying this to be, um, whatever, but my job isn't, isn't really that complicated in terms of the statistical nows. And plus we, we can work with people who have that knowledge. It's just about having the fundamental confidence that you know what to do. Mm. And I'm sure the question on the minds of a low stocky 23, 39 students is how much do you use data? <laughs> uh, uh, well, <laughs> not at all, but that's not, that, that's not the point because it's just a strength having a statistical package on your resume you're already ahead of other people because, you know, you know, like even in the ABS, they use um, SAS, which right. nobody else uses in any other business that I've been in. Right. Um, so even just knowing what a statistical programming is and being able to say, you know, hey, I ran these stats, even if they're descriptive, mm. um, you know, a friend of mine, he's just gone for a job at, I think it was, you know, numerous grad programs. I think it was the... Um, consumer watchdog or consumer crime commission or something like that. And the main job 
um, task for the interview um, was analyzing a data set. Right. Yeah. So that's analyzing a data set. Yeah. yeah. So they're obviously after that as a core foundation, not the job necessarily, but as a core kind of skill set in the in the package. Yeah. And so another, so you mentioned Excel. Is that the primary program that you I would use? say absolutely. Okay. Humble Excel. It is great. <laughs> it is re it really is. It's everybody usually either outputs it into Excel or inputs it into Excel at some point yeah. to, to do all the things they can't do through code. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, Excel is very powerful too. Mm. So there's a whole Power Query backend that not many people know about, but it's just as powerful. It's got SQL, it's got all the kind of complex programming languages for those high end users. Mm. So yeah, Excel, you know, I, I'm surprised that there's not more Excel based um, stuff at unis. Like, I mean, maybe there is now, but. I don't think I've heard of any. Oh, lovely. We have a question over here. Oh, hang on a moment. Oh, this pipes. Um, does the ABS take also qualitative experience students? Um, well, it's not that they it's not that they wouldn't by any stretch. Um, so I think at that point they probably would consider that because as long as it shows the ability to like learn a skill and apply it, um, then you know you're kind of halfway there. But obviously they would prefer, you know, if you're if you've done a maths degree and like a social science degree, you're gonna be very, very competitive in any environment. But I would say that it's, it's definitely a pitch that's worth making. And if it's nice and it's tightly about a project, um, then that shows a, a level of sophisticated learning and application, I would say. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question 100%. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure, you know, I know that even the big four, like Deloitte, KPMG, those guys usually have some kind of, you know, financial, statistical, data-based, you know, as part of the entry, yeah. So. Do we have any other questions? I think our question time is up. So thank you very much, Nathan, for coming in and talking. I know you've got to leave in a rush, so we'll get there. Yep. Nice. Yeah, we got to. <laughs> and I've got I, like I've got some business cards too. If anybody wants to oh. get in touch, because yeah, there's there's like the other people up here. Um, it's just um, yeah, you never know. Cool. Cool. And that's on the Thank you. Cool. Lovely. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. No worries. You think this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. That was really interesting. Thank you. Travel safe. <laughs> um, I've got notes on my phone because I don't have a printer. I hope that's not too unprofessional. Um, but hello, everyone. My name is Tim Capuano, and I graduated just last year with a dual arts social science degree uh, with majors in international relations and development. Um, I am currently working with Cardinal International Development, which is a leading uh, development contract management firm that's been delivering international aid and development projects on behalf of DFAT and other, other donor go uh, governments and organizations for over 50 years. Um, my role in particular is with the strategic engagement and partnerships team. And we primarily deal with preparing bids for tender um, to secure DFAT and other donor organizations proje projects, contracts for aid and development projects we mainly focus on Asia Pacific region at the moment, um, but we've got offices all over the world, which is really, really interesting. We often get to, to interact and, and chat with them. Um, we work across all development sectors, really, um, including agriculture and rural development, uh, climate change, mitigation and adaptation, education, gender and inclusion, 
um, post-conflict peace processes, social and environmental impact management, and more that I could talk for five minutes listing them. Um, and it's really interesting across all of these sectors, Cardno works to deliver really sustainable solutions to complex problems um, in really complex uh, environments, politically and, and socially as well. Um, so my role, I'm a, an assistant manager. Um, I basically, it consists of a lot of reading of DFAT documents, um, country research, recruitment, um, interviews with key team leaders, um, and, and, where am I? And, uh, yeah, specialist advisors, um, a lot of project costing, um, which is some more Excel, which is great. Get on that Excel if you're not sure, <laughs> clearly. Um, editing and quality assuring other teams work. So collaborative writing is a big key element of that. Um, and, and yeah, a lot of tailoring writing to specifically meet strategic objectives set out in DFAT projects. Um, and I think a lot of you, if you've done a social science degree, a lot of those things are social science based and I've definitely felt prepared through, through the degree. Um, there's a lot of strategic meetings held with senior, ma senior managers thinking about um, sort of the strategic approach to a particular bid, as well as meetings with partner organizations who are teaming up with um, to deliver um, sort of the strongest possible proposal. Um, and it's interesting, to be honest, I probably didn't expect to end up working in the private uh, sector, especially in development. Um, I am incredibly grateful for the really critical lens, I think, that I've gotten through uh, the development major of the social science program. Um, and it's really interesting. I definitely walked in interested to see what I would see. Um, but with eyes wide open, uh, I already am working towards improving the industry as best I can. Um, I found myself on the gender and inclusion community of practice that's within Cardno. Um, and that's really looking at um, further furthering gender equality and inclusion across all of our program delivery um, and within our workspace as well. Um, and I'm also extremely interested in the, the trend towards localization that's happening sort of across the entire um, region. I think that is really important um, just based on, on everything that, that we, we get a high level view of, of the development industry, but understanding a bit more of how it works on the ground, that localization is key and it's happening, but it's, it's how do we get it right? And how do we do it right? Um, and the, the good thing is that there's a lot of monitoring, evaluation and learning that's happening on the backside of everything that's happening there as well. So we're, we're aiming for best practice um, and we're aiming for better practice as well. And that's really encouraging for me to see. I've only just sort of started the last couple of weeks. Um, what well, not weeks now, it's been more than, more than a month now, but still very fresh, but it's encouraging to see. Um, some of the projects that we've delivered, just for examples, we've got the uh, Pacific Women Shaping Pacific Development Support Unit. Um, which is a 10 year investment by the Australian government to improve the political, economic and social opportunities for women across 14 different Pacific Island forum countries, which is fantastic. Uh, there's the Australian Indonesia Health Security Partnership, which is promoting a stronger government of Indonesia uh, systems and coordination to prevent, detect and respond to public health and animal health threats. Again, really interesting, especially in the COVID uh, pandemic situation we find ourselves in. Uh, the Papua New Guinea, Biodiversity program aims to curb unsustainable uh, natural resource use and damage to terrestrial and marine ecosystems through ecological and local governance capacity assessment that um, really informs community engagement moving forward. Um, and those three are, are three out of many, but it sort of hopefully it shows the, the breadth of the type of work that that goes on. Um, alongside my role at Cardno, I've also been working probably for nearly two years with the community development uh, uh, yeah, Community Development Queensland. Um, they're a, a networking group um, that's, that's relatively local, statewide, um, and on their planning committee. And I'm a, a key communication, playing a key communications role with them at the moment. I've been, um, I've been, been coordinating uh, a festival that's been coming up, um, six week festival. Um, working with volunteers and things like that. Um, and if anyone is interested in the community sector, I know some are 
Fernanda. Um, yeah, definitely check out Community Development Queensland's Facebook page. There's it's just a good place to be, especially for networking and and meeting meeting people. Um, and am I going for time? Should be okay. Um, another couple of minutes, great. So. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm relatively fresh, which is exciting, but I thought um, I've sort of taken the long road to get to where I am, especially as a student. Um, so I thought I might talk a little bit about how I actually got here. Um, so I traveled a lot out of high school. That was always the international space was always really interesting to me and that was the main focus. Um, but then to pay for all those travels, I took a job laboring. Uh, which I continued through the first few years of my study and the 4am wake up calls were not uh, that helpful for my study routines. Um, but I, um, yeah, after a number of years, I progressed and, and got to the office and was ending up doing some bid estimating of construction projects, um, again, using Excel. Um, but it was sort of that, that uni job that sort of just getting through uni on it, I'd be making coffee otherwise. I don't know. It was sort of whatever. Um, but yeah, it was essentially that role coupled with um, obviously my, my uni degree and my other, other experiences throughout uni. I've got a long list here, but I won't go through it. Um, but that super bizarre role that I found myself in, the skills I got there coupled with the social science degree um, and the background of my other degree that um, landed me being uh, eventually, um, what's the word? Um, yeah, picked up on LinkedIn. I didn't even apply for this role, which was after six months of desperately job hunting, pretty hilarious. Um, sent in a lot, I think over 80 applications, many rewritten, you know, bios on LinkedIn and things like that. Um, and then someone just found me on LinkedIn. So I think one of my key takeaways is definitely do as much as you can. Whatever you are doing, even if you think it's a bit you know, you, you can't really see how it's connecting to, to your future work after uni and all of that. There's skills you're learning along the way that if you can identify how to articulate that to employers um, or, or, or online as well on, on your LinkedIn and things like that, it really is valuable. Um, and yeah, I guess if you haven't started yet, get started, get the LinkedIn, apply for the the volunteer role, do the committee thing. What you guys are doing is great, you know? Um, and yeah, we'll get there. You'll get there. I got there. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Ah. Sorry, technology. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. So does anyone have any questions for Tim? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I was like, I can see you online too there, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so fantastic. There's so many lessons in there to reflect on. But like the way you spoke about how you landed this job is that you had a really, obviously a very impressive, you've got this wonderful backstory, but you communicate it well. Yeah. So can you speak to that about, you know, we talk about the language of crafting your career narrative yeah. or having your story. Can you tell us how you weaved your story so that everything held together? Yeah, it, it's interesting too, because I think I had the, the community development side, which I'm really passionate about, but at the same time, I don't think it's where I, I ended, I envisioned my sort of career going. I, I was probably more career driven just from the skills um, that I've got towards this international development side, but I still really want to interweave both of, both of them. And if please don't go and read the bio for the sake of it, but on the bio, and this is the communication thing you're talking about, I was saying, I'm really interested about um, how the world impacts communities at their level um, and how policy affects them at their level, but then also how communities acting also impact the, the, the global reality that we're all sort of living in. And it, it's, it's a bit social science, I guess. It's a social science concept that I can't shake, but I see myself as trying to bridge that gap. I can talk in that community language one-on-one um, -on -one with, with people, vulnerable people. Um, and I'm obviously a, a white guy, educated Australian, you know, I can't get more privileged than I am really. Um, so hopefully using that privilege to leverage my ability to, to champion issues on the ground with, you know, to get, um, to, to hit those 
real impact points. We, we need to be working at, at a high level as well as from the bottom up, I think. Um, and, um, and that involves talking to governments, even when they're problematic, talking to the private sector, even when it's problematic, it's a lot of problematic stuff, um, out there. Um, and yeah, I think it'll be interesting just to see how, um, how we work in that problematic world. I don't think, cause I, I've landed in a few different areas uh, in the last few months and everywhere is problematic. Um, so anyway, enjoy that little tidbit, but yes, yeah. Communi communicating is important and it's worth sitting down for hours and hours and hours and nutting out the paragraph. I think I've spent more than more, more than an hour, two, three o over the last year, reformulating that as well. Um, and that's just cause I was at home without a job and I really was stressing. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps. I'm sorry. I elaborate, el elaborated a bit as well. You've got to have that killer pitch, don't you? Killer. You've got to, and, and not leave it to your potential employer to figure out who you are. Don't let them read through them. the, yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. let them try and read through the lines. Like part of my role is literally recruiting as well for, for team leader positions on hundred million dollar projects. And it's funny, it's flick, flick, flick. So you want it to look really good. And just that, that first few paragraphs, really clear. And tailor it obviously i mean you've heard this a million times but do do tailor it to, to what you want uh, same approach as someone using a tinder app <laughs> except except a bit more selective maybe i <laughs> i'm not sure i'm not sure yeah <laughs> happily partnered thank you <laughs> fantastic we have might have time for one more question if we have it So I'm interested, what are some of your roles within the community development yeah. organization? Yeah. Yeah, great. So Community Development Queensland is a really um, quite a loose network of people. It's volunteer driven. There's three or four main meetings a year um, that's done by the committee. And besides that, it's a lot of emailing back and forth. There's subcommittee meetings and things like that. And what I love about City of Queensland is it's really non-hierarchical. There's no president or leader. Also means there's no accountability for anyone doing anything, um, which has been really fun trying to pull this, um, this volunteer led uh, festival together. But um, if, you, if you want a, a, a role, you can take mine over. Um, there's, <laughs> um, but so for example, I, um, I basically turned up to the meeting I was saying, you know, I had a few emails that weren't replied to. I think we're missing a key demographic of young, young people because we're not utilizing the Facebook. How about we up that a little bit? Would anyone like to do that? And they said, you can do that, Tim. And so I started doing that. <laughs> and I was talking to someone on the side um, in a break between a meeting. And I said, It'd be, you know, I love hanging out with these types of people um, who are community minded and, and all of that. Um, it'd be great to just have a chill thing to do so why don't we start a reading group and now there's been a reading group going but i'm also running that um <laughs> so it's quite a great space and I, I really would recommend if anyone wants to get involved it i think we we're talking the other day and the price of admission is participation is what they said so if you're willing to shop and participate you are more than welcome to come in and it's a great place to learn it's how i learned to not freak out with um more senior people with people who know more than me um, and yeah, it's a great, great place. Um, but I'm sure there are other, other organizations like that as well, um, around, the, around the track. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Might not answer your question directly, but it's quite an article, which is cool. Oh, that's all good. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tim. No worries. Thank you. We have, uh, Cecilia up next. Here we go. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone. Lovely to be here. So um, I work at uh, 86 Brisbane. So 86 is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Community Health Service. I work as a research officer. 
So I graduated from social sciences with a major in health three months ago. Um, I started working the Monday after exam week, <laughs> so I didn't really get much of a break, but I was really excited to, even though everyone was like, you should take a break, how are you not having a break? I was really excited to get started. Um, so a little bit about ASICS, we are Queensland's largest, most comprehensive Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health service. So our service, uh, we have a very holistic model of care. So we run a kindy, we run school programs, uh, we have a vaccination clinic, we have GP, um, family wellbeing services, youth justice, and then we have a um, nursing center for our um, yeah, age population. So it's a very holistic model of care. And you're probably wondering, what is a social science student doing in a clinic? <laughs> um, I'm doing research, so I'm a research officer. And I'm currently working on four research projects. And one of them um, I'm leading, it's a housing research project, our main one. So we're measuring the impact of homelessness, sorry, the effect of community-led support and wraparound support on housing trajectories. So we're working with homeless women and children who are at risk of domestic violence. The second project is measuring the relationship between domestic violence and alcohol consumption in three different areas of Queensland. The third one is a youth justice outreach one. So it's an internal snapshot. Um, we do a youth outreach service. Every night we get into a car. Um, we work with Queensland Police Service. So before incarcerating our youth, we'd like to go out there, have a chat, see what's going on maybe put them in the car and take them home. And yeah, our fourth one is an IT one. It's a data governance and sovereignty in the indigenous context. Um, the reason being is that we have so many clinics and so much data and we've created essentially a data pool where we're trying to link all the data and our services. And it's been part of this really large strategy. And we've now sat down and said, okay, there might be some ethical considerations here. Um, so that's the fourth one. Um, so yeah, the, it's only been three months. I've only been in the role for three months. It's been amazing so far. I'm mostly focused, unlike um, our first speaker, I'm mostly focused on qualitative methods. So speaking a little bit into your course um, list, has anyone here done SOCI 3329, the qualitative methods course? Yeah. And then there's the quantitative one that they spoke about earlier, um, Poly 3000, anyone? The policy course? Yeah. So my day-to-day, 8.30 -day, to 4.30, is a combination of those three courses. I'm constantly <laughs> analyzing um, data. Uh, I'm the qualitative person. So we're 400 staff members and only two of us are doing research. So we're kind of being used as a resource. Um, so every kind of team right now is trying to see how they can best use these two people that are only focusing on research. So it's really, it's really been about what, what I've done in social sciences and all the qualitative methods that I've brought into that. So I got the job because, um, has anyone done the SOSC 321, the long project course yet? No? Yeah, yeah. So it's the social science, the, the last year of course. Um, the, the project I was assigned to was a housing one. So in my interview, they asked um, if I'd ever done any housing research. And I said, yes, I had. So I was told after that the reason I got um, the job is because they were looking for someone who knew qualitative methods, um, was aware of the you know cross-cultural co competency of working with indigenous research, and had done housing research. So I, my colleague always tells me, you niched yourself really well. I'm like, yes, maybe I did. But um, that project course is something I really spoke about strongly in my CV. And I spoke about it strongly um, in my interview as well. Because in my opinion, that was, that's a whole year of your degree. And I saw it as a full-time commitment to a project. And so I really spoke strongly to that. And to my advantage, they were looking for someone who had done housing. Um, so things I did maybe throughout my degree, I also, I volunteered a lot. I did an internship um, with Kaima Foundation. So I was doing monitoring and evaluation. Um, again, using a lot of qualitative methods and really integrating that into um, impact, into outcome. So yeah, 
A research role is very similar to any evaluation or social impact role that you'll have. Like I said before, you are a resource. So you're really, really going to be working with multidisciplinary environments. Sometimes I'm sitting next to social workers. Sometimes I'm sitting next to dentists and it's very um, mixed. Um, yeah, I don't think I have too much more to add on to that. It's been, like Tim said, short journey so far, but yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Tatelia? Let me get my... Mine's a little bit basic, but I was just wondering what you think is the best way to find volunteer opportunities while you're at uni? Yeah. Um, so with the, I started volunteering through the HATS faculty. That's how I started. Um, with the internship I was doing, I did a lot of networking. It was through my connections and through meeting people and talking to people and I can't stress that enough because there will be one out of 10 people that you, I don't know, connect with or network with that might have an opportunity come up. And like Tim said, get out there, get on LinkedIn, connect. Um, I remember even drafting a document with all the organizations that I was interested in and starting to make a sort of short list and just to get your eye out and maybe randomly even just checking their pages and seeing if you can email them or even just check, you know, let them know you're interested and you're willing to work as a volunteer or as an intern and just really putting yourself out there. No one's going to offer you a volunteer position. That's what I've found. It's always easier to, to, to speak to people and every single person you meet, let them know what your passions are and what drives you. It's really great advice. Um, anyone else have any questions? Um, I guess I, I'm not sure, maybe it's because I've always had a passion for social determinants of health. I've always had a really strong blood boiling passion for it. And so every single conversation I found myself in, maybe it sounded like I was selling myself, but it was because of that drive. And it's because I found my niche and maybe I'm fortunate. Um, but I really found that early on and I knew exactly what I wanted to do and what I wanted to do it for and maybe just having that drive and I'm not saying that everyone has to have it figured out and that can't change in five years but just finding what really you love and what you're passionate about. Wonderful. I'll just quickly second that as well but from a different angle I really really struggled to start putting myself out there. I remember sort of the moment that I engaged with uni properly um, and it was a moment, but then I was like, okay, I need to start going to things. And it was really difficult. So if you're struggling, my advice is start small and this sort of thing is perfect and just keep going and just treat, keep trying to push yourself one up. Um, just take the next step, the next step, the next step. And, um, I mean, tonight was really nerve wracking for me as well, yeah. you know, super. And I'm sure you'd say the same, <laughs> um, but yeah. This is me keeping on going and I'm sure you too. So yeah, just keep, keep on moving. Sorry, I'd just like to add to that. Um, the strategy I used for applications as well, if anyone's interested, I started really early on. Through my internship, I learned that recruitment and onboarding takes a really long time. And so I started in mid-semester. I started all my applications in mid-semester and I would dedicate an hour every day from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. to... <laughs> I'd like to read. <laughs> I did have a life. <laughs> I did other things as well. <laughs> um, but I really pumped out applications like obsessively. Um, and I really did dedicate. And that's something my friend actually told me to do is to just put an alarm for an hour. And even if it's not sending applications, just dedicate that one hour to that space. Um, and yeah, just pump out applications. <laughs> Uh, does anyone have any last questions?
Okay, no, thank you so much no to worries. Julia. That was thank great presentation. Lovely. And uh, next up, we have Ella from the Policy Futures Graduate Program. Hi guys, um, thanks for having me. Ooh, might move into this deck so I can't really see everyone around the poll. <laughs> um, thanks so much for um, thinking of the program and reaching out. Um, I'm a past UQ student. Um, I did a Bachelor of Business and a Bachelor of Arts, so um, HR and Sociology, um, and graduated in 2017. So, but I'm more here to talk about the program. Um, so I'm uh, the graduate coordinator for the Policy Futures Graduate Program. It's Queensland Government um, Graduate Program. Um, so just a bit about the program. Does anyone know about it? Roughly, kind of, cool, cool. <laughs> Is anyone, I know one person's, so our current recruitment process, I should say, um, the ship has kind of sailed <laughs> um, for 2022, unfortunately. So we um, have kind of, closed our application form. Um, and if you guys are, if anyone's part of the process, you'll know that the dreaded um, online cognitive testing is currently taking place. So, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but basically just the program itself is a two year temporary graduate program. Um, we offer graduates sort of three different placements throughout the two years. So um, two six month placements in the first year and then um, a year long placement in the second year. Um, so basically the role is um, a graduate policy officer. Um, so you could be working in one of, look it does vary every year and especially when a government changes, the departments change, but 18 to 21 different agencies to choose from, um, which is yeah, really varied. Um, <laughs> so yeah, depending on your interests, you could be working in, you know, Department of Environment and Science, Department of the Premier and Cabinet, um, and, or Department of Justice and Attorney General. Um, there's just, yeah, Queensland Police Service, it's quite, it's quite broad. Um, but we find um, that a lot of arts graduates um, are drawn to the program and public sector um, as a career option. And I think that's probably because you guys tend to be pretty community minded um, and yeah, want to make a difference um, to the communities that you live in. Um, so yeah, that's sort of an overview of the program. Um, the program's also got a really great learning and development program, um, which I'm not just saying that, it's sort of, um, you know, probably five times what a regular public servant would get. Um, it's yeah, everything from policy skills, obviously, to career development, um, a mentoring program, um, yeah, writing for government. Um, yeah, and I guess the main thing that we find graduates say um, is actually just having a cohort of people come through the sector with them and start with them is just probably the biggest benefit that they get from the program. Um, so what does a policy officer actually do? Um, it is really broad. <laughs> it's like a really, really broad um, career path to go down, which is great if you have a really niche kind of area that you're interested in or not. So it kind of gives you a lot of options. And the idea of the program is to give you exposure to three different areas so you can kind of feel that out. Um, but basically um, it's to contribute to how the government delivers public services, provides better outcomes for communities and day-to-day -day, um, on the ground that could involve research um, working with stakeholders, community engagement, um, usually a fair amount of writing, whether that's correspondence, briefing notes, um, contributing to cabinet submissions, that kind of thing. But yeah, it can really, really vary. It could be working on a project. It could be, yeah, working with stakeholders. It, yeah, it's very, very broad, which um, well, I know when I came out of uni, I did two very broad <laughs> majors. I was not sure what I wanted to do, so yeah. Um, I know a lot of people like that. <laughs> um, awesome. So yeah, I guess that's a really broad overview of what the program is. Does anyone have any questions from like sort of a recruitment perspective? Because I guess I'm in HR. Um, so I'm happy to talk to that because I feel like there's been an element of that throughout what everyone's been saying tonight. Um, yeah, just another simple question, but how many um, graduates 
or graduate positions are offered each year and does that change from year to year or is it always the same? Yeah, it does change a little bit every year and with COVID and um, sort of the constraints that were put on recruitment during that, we have a smaller cohort this year, but for our 2020 cohort, 2022 cohort, sorry, I should say, and kind of ongoing, it's about 35, um, which is great. Um, it's a really good number. So um, yeah, lots of people from varied backgrounds. We're open to all disciplines, but we do find that, yeah, 30% um, of all of our um, graduates over the seven years that the program's been running have been arts graduates. Uh, another 30 have been law graduates and the rest sort of scattered <laughs> throughout other disciplines. So it, yeah, there's obviously a really good linkage um, to yeah, your studies um, and the work that you can get exposed to. Moving out of shot now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess this is a question as well um, uh, for, I guess, for anyone to answer. Um, what I've been kind of toying with at the moment is, okay, you do have to sell yourself, obviously, and the skills that you have and that you feel that you can you can present in, in the workplace. But, you know, I guess you're not going to know everything. And I guess balancing those expectations of an employer as when you start, like, you know, obviously you're learning as you go what's that like balancing balancing those two things i guess and i guess what are those expectations of employer of your employer um and how you come to learn as you go yeah that's a really good question i think from a recruitment perspective i'll start with that i guess we are very much aware that graduates come from a variety of life experiences and backgrounds um which is kind of part of the reason there's a few things in our recruitment sort of methodology that um we like to do to sort of make sure we're not disadvantaging anybody really. So we don't actually use GPA um, as part of our um, assessment. We also um, don't really, I won't say care, <laughs> but we're not focused too much on extracurricular things that you might've done. Fantastic if you have, and it'll really help you in an interview to have great experiences to draw on, to give really good, you know, meaty examples. But on like face value, we're not going to go, oh, look, this person's, you know, done everything at uni and they've, you know, it's like, what about the person that had to work full time while they're at uni? You know, like we, yeah, we don't kind of put a huge emphasis on that. Um, so that's from a recruitment perspective. But once you're in the workplace, I suppose, um, it really varies from team to team. But I think one of the beauty, uh, the beauty of a graduate program, I guess, is don't want to say <laughs> you can be like, oh, I'm just a graduate, but you kind of can. Um, you know, you can kind of say, I'm new, you know, I don't know everything yet. Um, this is what I can offer though. And I think it, the idea of like our supervisors um, across the sector, we, you know, we have a bit of a program with them where we are trying to help them become more of a coach and really see it. You know, Teams, it's so broad, but 35 different grads, 35 different placements, 35 different teams. So we really try and let supervisors know maybe they haven't had a grad before. A lot of them have, but we try and be quite clear that, you know, this person's new. Um, that you're not expected to know everything. So really, we try and really foster um, a supportive kind of environment. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Thing is like a, oh thank you you don't um, want to undersell yourself either <laughs> yeah yeah it's a fine kind of balance but also really just is. like you know if you don't have any experience how do you get that first experience in in the workforce or at least you know getting an internship when you haven't had one before um yeah. you know I guess how do you sell up the the skills that you learn in uni um to get that first experience to kind of get you that jump start yeah I guess for us, and I, I mean, I can't speak for every employer, and we're a bit of a weird employer um, in that we're the government. <laughs> um, we're not private sector, um, so I don't really know how that world works, to be honest. But um, in government, if you're ever going for a government job, really looking at the role description, because we're really bound by fairness and um, the merit system. So if you're looking at a role description from the government and there's key capabilities, if you can give an example, and it doesn't have to be a work example, um, it can be a study example um, for how you've demonstrated that, that is gold um, for government recruitment. Um, it's not coming in and just, you know, spouting out facts about how great you are. It's you'll be asked a behavioural question in a government interview or 
have to answer a behavioural sort of competency in your written application for a government program. And if you can say, oh yes, I have um, good stakeholder engagement skills because I did this project at uni and this is how I managed it. That's what we're looking for. Not, I did a million things, how great am I? <laughs> yeah. Lovely, so do we have any other questions? Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, do the different departments have quotas on, on how many they take? So like if you want to be in the Attorney General's department, but they're not taking any this year. Yeah, yeah. You you don't get in or no, how, no, how um, does that work? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a rundown of how the placements work. That's a really good question. Um, so basically each agency kind of nominates to have a certain amount of placements. Um, so for example, Department of Premier and Cabinet might have five placements this year um, but because there's three rotations that means there's 15 opportunities over the two years for you to be placed in that agency um, so the way we work placements out um, and I'm doing it at the moment and it's very hard because <laughs> I don't like saying no to anybody but basically um, we send a survey out to our grads with all of the placement options um, and they give us their preferences. Um, and then it's my job <laughs> to try and marry those preferences up. And there's always some that are much more popular than others. And, and we basically try and match as best we can to preferences. And if you don't get your first preference or a high preference in your first rotation, we'll prioritize you for the second rotation and so on and so forth. There are some agencies which I can almost guarantee are always going to participate. Um, uh, Department of, of um, Justice and Attorney General is one of them. Um, Department of Premier and Cabinet, because we run it, that's where I'm from. Um, yeah, the Public Service Commission, um, some of those really central agencies, education, health, um, some of the smaller agencies, particularly the ones that go through machiner machinery of government changes, um, they move around a bit. So sometimes they fall off, unfortunately, when teams move and things like that. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thanks. And just one more, what happens at the end of the two years? Yeah, very good question. It is a temporary <coughs> program. So there isn't a guarantee of a role at the end of the two years, but we have fantastic outcomes. So in the second year of the program, um, learning and development shifts to be like focused on career development and helping graduates get to that next opportunity. We also encourage graduates, particularly in the second year, to um, apply for secondments and higher duties opportunities. And we find that a lot of graduates are snapped up really quickly. So for our current cohort who are finishing in February, um, I've actually, out of the 35, I've, we've got eight left um, on the program. Wow. So this time of year, it, everyone just starts getting snapped up. It, the grads have a really great profile within the sector because they've been kind of far and wide. Most people in the policy space have come in contact with a Policy Futures grad and they go, oh, they're great. Um, <laughs> I want one of them in my team. So um, it's, yeah, it's not a guarantee, unfortunately. And the reasoning for that, unfortunately, is because I don't want to get into boring <laughs> stuff, but basically um, it's funded by placements and we can't as the agency that administers it we can't tell agencies you have to have you have to hire this person because we're kind of doing it on their behalf it's a bit gross unfortunately that side of it but it does seem to work quite well um, I do have the stats yeah 81 percent of graduates sort of remain over the life of the program have remained in Queensland government and of those graduates 94 have um, secured roles um, at a level higher, at least, um, than they came in at. Um, so, and then 70% have been two levels above. So grads come in at AO3 level, which is about um, 65,000 a year. Um, and often um, after the two years or a year and a half or towards the end of the program are uh, going into an AO5 level role, which is 86,000 a year. Just to give you like a bit of an idea of the remuneration. <laughs> cool. Fantastic. Any other questions? Yeah. 
So I know it was touched on already, but could you tell me what the recruitment team is looking for in applications? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for policy, um, as I was sort of touching on before with the type of work that you're doing, um, you might be relieved to know um, it's a lot more qualitative um, and well, not always, but yeah, there's a lot of writing involved and the research, it, it can be both, but we're really looking for writing skills because writing sort of the bread and butter of policy. So yeah, really good written communication skills. Verbal communication skills are great as well because you might have to be verbally brief briefing people and working with stakeholders and that kind of thing. But there's a lot of writing <laughs> that happens in government, a lot of briefing, a lot of layers to get through. Um, you know, it's government, <laughs> can't, um, no bones about that. But um, yeah, and then in terms of other things that we're looking for, um, community mindedness is really high on the list. And that's probably why we have, like I was saying, so many social science grads. Um, so when there's a written part, um, like a motivation for applying question, we're looking for grads that say, I'm really passionate about um, making positive change for the community. Um, I, I want to contribute this. Um, we're very much about grads that um, are wanting to contribute rather than what, what can they get out of it. Um, you know, sometimes we get applications that are like, oh, it, it's so great. Um, the re, the um, salary is really great and I love the learning and development. And we're like, okay, cool. But, you know, so definitely don't do that, um, which I'm sure none of you would. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I guess other things that are really important in terms of capability, yeah, stakeholder engagement I've mentioned a bit, but... Um, definitely resilience and flexibility it's a big thing to um you know go from three different teams over two years it requires a fair amount of resilience and agility um and yeah it's, it's hard um so you know being prepared for that um and taking it as an opportunity um is really important and if you can demonstrate that you're willing to kind of work in different environments and you know pick things up really quickly and kind of run with it. Um, that's, that's what we're looking for as well. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Fantastic. And I just have one question. You mentioned the 2022 um, slots have closed. Yes. 2023. Yes. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> so we are looking um, to hopefully open a little bit earlier for recruitment for 2023. Um, so one thing I haven't mentioned actually um, is how I got my role. Um, not that you guys probably want to work in HR, um, but <laughs> I got my role through the Queensland Government Graduate Portal. So, and that is the first step to applying for the program. Um, usually opens in March each year, but just keep an eye, if you want to follow the Queensland Government Graduates on Facebook, they'll let you know when the next portal is open. You can put your hat in this year's portal as well. So the way I got my role is I was in the portal, I had my degree listed, um, the DPC, or Department of, sorry, acronyms, this is a very government thing, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the Department of Premier and Cabinet HR team put an expression of interest out to the grad portal. So just because I was in there, that was the only way they advertised it. Um, that's how I got my role. So definitely worth spending a minute to fill out the, the form to put your hat in the ring. Um, Anyway, so that's the first step. So in March next year or thereabouts, um, the portal for 2023 programs will open. Pop your name in there and you'll get an email when we go live. Um, and we're hoping to do it before June, depending on approvals processes, which if you do end up in government, you will learn a lot about. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, uh, eligibility, I should mention. Um, so we accept graduates um, who have completed undergraduate or higher. So, you know, even if you go away and then you come back and you do a grad cert or something like that, you'll be re-eligible um, for the next two years. So um, for the 2022 program, it's the last two years. So anyone who, um, what the dates? But yeah, 1 January 2020 to 1 February 2022 are eligible for next year's program, if that makes sense. So you've kind of got two years, so you can apply twice um, if you want to apply the year you graduate and the year after. So yeah, it's definitely worth copying your hat in the ring if you're interested in policy. There's, it's so broad. You can really test it out and kind of then decide 
if you want to drill down into a specific policy area, maybe it's environment policy, maybe it's social policy, maybe it's geo resources policy. I, you know, it's, um, it's a really, really broad um, space and government does a lot. Um, you know, there's limitations and constraints that we work within, obviously, but um, yeah, if, if it's interesting to you, there's lots of opportunities and the graduate portal, graduate programs aren't the only way to get in. I'm proof of that. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you.